Okay, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm going to stay seated if that's okay, because we're going to try and record as well, just for people who can't uh, join us in person. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning for our first GA Museum Book Club live event. So I know some of you have been uh, joining us online over the pandemic, so it's great to be able to do an in-person event. And it's an honour for us to have Humphrey Kelleher here with us this morning. Um, for uh, to discuss his book, The GA Family Silver, which um, I'm sure most of you have read or know about at this stage. And um, we do have copies still in the museum. It was out of print, but thankfully now there's a way to, to print it again. So there is some available, which is brilliant. And um, we're going to just record ourselves. You guys aren't being recorded, just so you know, um, in, in case um, anyone would like to watch online later. There, we do have some members across, uh, across the seas as well. So it'd be nice for them to have the option of joining in. Um, I, we're going to chat for a little while and then if anyone has any questions along the way, put your hands up and um, I'll, uh, uh, we can do it at the end or even during the discussion. It's going to be pretty informal and um, we've lots of stories. We do have a tour coming in here around 12, so we'll try and keep it to the hour or so. And then um, if anyone would like, we'll, we'll take a quick stroll through the museum and just have a look at some of the cups that we've been talking about this morning. And if you'd like to stay for a while in the museum, then you're more than welcome. It's just got an upgrade on the ground floor, so it looks really well. So nice to spend some time here. So welcome, Humphrey. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Julianne. Um, if you can't hear, just let me know and I'll try and jig the microphones a little bit. Um, so Humphrey, um, instead of a lovely, quiet retirement, you decided to undertake the crazy project of finding out about 100 GAA trophies. Why did you do that? Well, before I start, I was looking forward to today and I was quite relaxed about it until about 10 minutes ago when my eldest son turned up here uh, <laughs> who, <laughs> who helped me on the book. So anyway, uh, yeah, it was out of necessity to some degree, Julianne. Uh, I was very privileged to be doing some commentary uh, on the radio with Michal Amarahertig, the great Michal. And it was the 2009 Leinster Hurling final between Dublin and Kilkenny. And at, half, uh, at the, at the uh, minor match was just over. And uh, the Kilkenny minor captain was being presented with the cup. And Con Murphy of RT said to me, Humphrey, he said, he said, what's the name? What's the name of the cup being presented down below uh, the commentary position? And I looked at him as if I, I, I haven't a clue. So uh, now it wasn't live on the radio, it was off. Yeah. <laughs> it was showing the ads. So the next day I came into Crow Park, prior to your time, and um, I asked, have you got the book on the cups? To which the response was, what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, a book on the J cups, and they said, no. And I thought a bit about it, and I said, there's an idea now. Yeah. So I just went about it and I didn't know how to go about it. But there was a man uh, here working here, uh, a great Clare man called Sean O'Leary, who worked here for many, many years, taught me about the Cardinal O'Fee Library in Armagh. And that was my first port of call. It was a library, a very famous library mm. in Armagh. So that's how I got started working on the book. And I went up there and I met a man called Donan McAnallan, who would be a brother of the late Cormac. And he was very, very helpful to me, giving me information on it. So that's how it started. Uh, it took me a couple of years, mind you, to get about finishing it, but eventually I did. Wow, and I'm sure like everything, that sounded like a good idea, but there was probably times when you were like, why did I start this? Yeah, um, our dining room at home, which was a lovely table on it, disappeared <laughs> under a clatter of sh papers, books, uh, magazines, everything you could need to, to do some research, and the computer. Uh, and of course, it was just one piece after the other, but it was nearly a labour of love to some degree, Julianne, uh, when you get a bit of success. And the biggest part of success was, I remember at least, uh, it was about half past one in the morning and I found some information that I was looking for. And I was so thrilled and I was going to go to my wife upstairs and then she said, <laughs> to tell her, but there was no way to share that piece yeah. of it. So like anybody who's done any book, and I see Siobhan Doyle here has done some, uh, uh, written some books, and she, I, I've no doubt, understands the, the, the joy of finding some information that was hard to find. Uh, and what were, I suppose, your main sources? Like, how would you go, for, like, we all know some of these books, but how do you go about 
find in the details? Well, I decided, first of all, what number of books, how many books would I do and where would you stop? Yeah. Because there are thousands and thousands of books being uh, uh, cups, cups being, uh, yeah. all, all over the, the country. So I just picked on a number, simply out of the sky, 101. And I started with the, uh, the national cups, and then I started going into the provincial cups, and then the colleges cups. And then I said I'd do the ladies football, the camogie, the puck fodder, and all of those. So they came about 101. But finding family members, and I call the book, as you know, the GA Family Syndrome. Yeah. And I assure you, it is a marvelous family to be involved with. And all I had to do was get somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who eventually got me the person I needed. And that's what it's about. It's a network. And I made so many friends of people who uh, were, you know, in, uh, related to the people who, after whom the cups were named. And they couldn't be nicer to me about giving me information and especially details about that person. Yeah. And photographs, which are very, very important for the book, which I believe makes it uh, very interesting. And are they pretty much all named after a person or are there some sponsors oh, or kind of corporate ones? Or there's that? a lot yeah. of corporate ones, uh, unusual ones. Uh, yeah. TWA Cup after an airline. Uh, there's um, the, the, the Cross of Cashel Cup, which, which is, we, which is we over brought here. out here because it's o a bit there. of a crazy looking cup. It is. <laughs> newspapers, um, the, the Anglo Celt, uh, which is the Ulster um, um, Provincial Cup, because they are the people with the money. And yeah. of course, there were the railway cups. Yeah. They, the Great Southern Western Railway, they had the money. Yeah. And just some of them after the Clergy, uh, McCrory Cup, the Croke Cup, and all yeah. of those. Um, it is only in latter years that became known after people. And sometimes it was a sad situation like. Um, Shane McGettigan, who, 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 who unfortunately sadly died, and then there was Danny McNaughton, and there's Cormac McAnall, and so yeah. it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, 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 rich, a rich mixture of people and companies. It's a real uh, history of the GA itself, isn't it, just by looking at the names of the Cubs? Oh, indeed, and, and not alone that, but you know, it, it, what I am delighted about is that it keeps people's memories alive, like Angus Murphy, who was a, 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 an army, um, a man who was um, sadly died in in terrible circumstances in the Lebanon, and for his family yeah. to have a cup named after him, yeah. and the same with Shane McGettigan, who, as you probably know, was uh, in a uh, Leitrim footballer who went over to Boston to work, a young lad, and um, he was up in a scaffolding, and he, he in fact the scaffolding collapsed. Yeah. And, and and he passed away and his father was Shane Mc, or Charlie McGettigan the who, singer the singer who and when I rang Charlie about it he was so thrilled yeah. that his uh, son's name would be remembered but interestingly enough on that particular one about a month before the um, the, the book was being published I uh, I met a, a very uh, well known um, priest uh, Monsignor Owen Tyne and Owen uh, was I was telling him about this book and I was telling him about Charlie uh, and Shane McGettigan and he said, do you know, he said, there was another young lad up in that scaffolding in oh. Boston as well and his name was Ronan Stewart from uh, Dundalk and he was killed as well but nobody remembers him. him yeah. So I got on to his father and I have him in the book as well. Oh, so to remember that young lad, uh, just a little snippet in with Shane. Yeah, because they each have a big story, I guess, each of the cops. Oh, yeah. It, it, it is great, but it's also the um, the people. I keep saying about the people because the book is about the people, really. The, the, the companies come and go. TWA are no longer in existence. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 of course, the Sweet Afton Cup. I don't know how many of you are here. John, you certainly remember. Uh, Jerry would remember the Sweet Afton cigarettes. You remember them well. <laughs> that is a, a marvelous story about uh, how that came about. Um, the um, uh, Carls, PJ Carls, were in Dundalk. Yeah. They were cigarette manufacturers, and they wanted to um, to to uh, commemorate uh, Robbie Burns, who was a very famous Scottish poet. And they uh, wanted to name these cigarettes, and they didn't know what name would they put on it. But it turns out that Robbie Burns' sister lived in and is buried in Dundalk. So to commemorate that connection, Carl's asked the people of Dundalk, what should they call the cigarettes? So Robbie Burns had written a very famous poem called Sweet Afton. All right, Jerry? Yeah. 
uh, straight after. And I'm, there's two lines of the poem on the cigarette packs. Oh my God. But what's very interesting about that is there was a man called Jerry Shelley. And Jerry Shelley was a representative from uh, Carl's. And he got the cup given to the GEA for the Monster Intermediate Hurling Cup. And Jerry was from um, Carrick and Shore in Tipperary. And Jerry Shelley played with Michael Hogan and Bloody Sunday here oh. in Crow Park. So it's a marvellous connection between a particular cup and Bloody Sunday. And I have a photograph in the book of Jerry and Michael Hogan on that Tipperary team. Wow, and then the, there's the Hogan Cup too, which is a brother of Michael Hogan. And connected to yourself, That's Julianne. right. <laughs> that's so you could, tell, you could tell a little more about well, that. Well, that's my, Michael Hogan is my grand uncle, so um, a lot obviously would know about him, but maybe not so many would know about, well, a couple of his brothers, Dan obviously is pretty famous as well, yes. but Tom Hogan then is the other, one of the other brothers, and uh, the college's cup is named after him. I think, Tom, you knew him as well, did you? Father. Oh, your father knew him. Father. Sorry, you're not that old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yes, Thomas, so yeah. Thomas Wilfred Hogan, uh, he, he, was, he did some marvellous work in Mullingar to promote the GAA and he was a brother of Michael mm. and they have that Hogan Cup but they have actually changed the cup, the physical silverware uh, on the last year right. or two as well so it's a new we actually idea. have some of Tom Hogan's correspondence down in the museum in the Bloody Sunday exhibition at the moment the Hogan family found uh, letters that he would have written back at the time when he went back to, to study and he was writing to check in on the, his sisters and his mother so they're down in, in the museum if you'd like to have a look afterwards um, but yeah so you could talk about each cup probably on its own for an hour but I want to go back to the start and you mentioned before there was trophies yeah uh, there was different ways of I suppose getting people interested in winning a competition there were, and I, I, I came across, and I have to read this because it's so interesting, I don't want to miss out on any particular word, but on um, uh, how people were rewarded for winning games and winning matches. So I have an extract here, and I actually have the original um, uh, article from the paper, and it was, again, some of you remember, the S's like R's, Jerry, if you remember, and uh, I had to be very careful in how to pronounce some of the words, so I decided to print <laughs> to make it easier. But this is an extract from the Ipswich Journal in 1782, and it was reproduced in the Hampshire Chronicle on the 17th of September, 1796. And I'll just, it'll take, it'll take about two minutes to read. But at a time when the Kingdom of Ireland seems to be rising to the highest degree of importance the following account of the manners and mode of living of the common people of that country extracted from Arthur Young's tour may be deemed not only amusing but instructive to many readers and it was the circumstances which struck me most common in the Irish while the vivacity and a great and eloquent volubility of speech now this is written in the 1700s yeah. And one would think that, could snuff, that they could take snuff and talk without tiring till doomsday. They're infinitely more cheerful and lively than anything we commonly see in England, having nothing of the incivility of sullen silence with which so many Englishmen seem to wrap themselves up as if retiring within their own importance. Listen to this. Lazy to excel at work, yeah. more spiritually active at play, that at hurling, which is the cricket of savages. <laughs> they show the greatest feats of agility. Their love of society is as remarkable as the curiosity is insatiable, and their hospitality to all comers, be their own poverty ever so pinching, has too much merit to be forgotten. There is an ancient custom here for a number of years of country neighbours among the poor people to fix up some young woman that ought, as they think, to be married. They, all, they also agree upon a young fellow as a proper husband for her. Thus determined, they send to the fair one's cabin to inform her that on Sunday following she is to be horsed, that is, carried on men's backs. She must then provide whiskey and cider for a treat 
as we'll all will pay her a visit after Mass for the hurling match. As soon as she is horsed, the hurling begins in which the young fellow appointed for her husband has been the eyes of all the company fixed on him. If he comes off conqueror, he is certainly married to the girl, but if he, another is victorious, he is certainly loses her, for the prize is for she is the prize of the victor. These trials were not always finished on one Sunday. They sometimes take two or three are as common expression when they are all over, such a girl was gold. Sometimes one barony hurls against another, but a marriageable girl is always the prize. So they were hurling for women and girls back in those My days. My God, I've got a different opinion of hurling now all of a sudden. So that was a very interesting, and that was the first prize that I found. My God. <laughs> but subsequently, you know, there were matches played against uh, landowners and they played for whiskey and they played for tobacco and things like that. And it wasn't until the 1800s that they started giving some trophies. And uh, as you well know here, Julianne, we believe one of the first for a hurling or football match or a hurling match in particular was the Silver Mines uh, yes, Cup. Yes, which is lovely. It's very simple. But I believe the first GAA trophy was given by uh, Dr. Croak uh, as... Um, for an athletics meeting. And you pro people here may know that when the GA was founded, it was primarily focused on athletics mm -hmm. rather than the Michael other Cusack games. Himself Michael was, Cusick yeah. was very much involved in that. But Dr. Croke would have presented the first uh, trophy cup at an athletics meeting in Tremor in County Waterford. Wow. So that's, that was the start of it. And then cups came in uh, with the silver mines and then over a period of time, uh, but interesting enough, the very the, the earlier um, I should say established days of the GEA, it was the colleges, Julianne, uh, for the Sigerson Cup and the Fitzgibbon Cup came in 1911, 1912 around then. So the colleges were a little bit ahead of the normal stream oh. uh, GEA. And we actually have um, there's a good few of these ones we're talking about in the museum, so we can point them out to you later. But there is some of the Davin brothers who were obviously great athletes, some of their cups that, yeah. the, uh, that they won for athletics yeah. are kind of some of the earlier th ones that we have in the museum. But the silver mines one is interesting because it's very, very simple, isn't it? It's just basically That's a goblet. That was, yeah. that was secured by Michael Cusick from a, a printing company here in Dublin. Uh, I think it was in the Orman Key. Uh, Coster and Johnson were their names. And they... Uh, I think Michael Cusick, in his job, in his work uh, uh, as a teacher, uh, would have used them uh, for, 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 used for printing uh, yeah, papers I, and things I like that. So yeah. that was where the connection was. So they were kind of early forms of sponsorship, nearly, in a way, weren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but there's one particular uh, connection here that, again, I would have found a bit more about since the book. And um, it is about the Arda Chalice which was the catalyst for the subsequent Sam Maguire Cup, uh, that the, the cup itself was found in, or the trophy, the, uh, the, the um, chalice was found in Limerick, and it was given to a company called uh, Johnson, Ed, Edmund Johnson, who was a silversmith to um, restore to its former glory. And I have some of the photographs here if people want to see them later. Uh, of the original uh, in, in, in being repaired mm -hmm. as such for the, um, for the, it was given to the Royal Irish Academy and Edmund Johnson got the job of, of, of restoring it. And partly what he did then, uh, he would have been very much, uh, short, his, his stock would have risen quite a good bit right. on, on that, uh, for, for that um, work that he had done. His, his company then uh, in, uh, would have um, done uh, tea sets in the design wow. of the Arda Chalice. Now, Sam hasn't arrived at all at this stage. These okay. are the early days of the, you know, uh, um, the, the design, before the 19th, yeah. before, before the uh, cup was uh, made in, in, in 1928 by Matthew Staunton. But prior to that, um, the cups, there are three cups, Julianne. There are the Lee McCarthy, there's a Sam Maguire, 
and there's a National Football League Cup were all made by the same family yes. members and the Stauntons, the famous, well, uh, great um, silversmiths, uh, and they're all called Matthew. Oh, very They good. were descendants of the Huguenots who were turfed out of France in the 1690s and they came to Ireland and they were silversmiths. They brought the, the skill and the trades. So uh, in the early days, like Lee McCarthy Cup was made prior to Sam. Sam, yes. And it was made, without doubt, in my view, it was made by the Edmund Johnson Company, but it was made by Matthew Stone within that company. Right. People have said that it was made by Edmund Johnson in 1920, which would have been very, very difficult because Edmund Johnson died in 1900. Oh. <laughs> uh, he would have risen to do marvellous things. So within that company of Edmund Johnson, it was um, Matthew Staunton, was the senior, senior, the silversmith, who made it. In 1920, when the doll was just started, they wanted to promote Irish within schools. And they approached uh, Edmund Johnson Company to make uh, images or replicas of the Arda Chalice. And they made eight of them, two for each province, girls and boys, to promote Irish. And the man who was very much instrumental in that was a man called Frank Fahey, who was a TD at the time. They wanted to promote it, and they were called Kernadola. That is interesting subsequently. So the Kernadola Cups were made, and they were presented to schools all over the country for Irish purposes, uh, around, the, around the same time as the Lee McCarthy Cup was made. And to the Johnson Company made the replicas of the uh, the oh, wow. chalice. And then, uh, in in in, in uh, when uh, Sam McGuire died in 1927, friends of his got together and they raised money to make uh, the Sam McGuire Cup. And they went to a company called Hopkins and Hopkins, whose uh, whose trade or their hallmark is on the cup, but they didn't make it. They didn't have the wherewithal to do it. Right. So they went to Matthew Staunton's son, also Matthew Staunton. So that's and where it can get confusing for historians is. and researchers. And that son has another son. <laughs> Called Matthew. Matthew, who's still alive <laughs> and well oh, wow. and living okay. today. And there's a man here today who worked with that original Matthew Staunton who made the Sam McGuire and it's John Doyle here in front of us oh, wow. and his wife Angela. And they are made. So I want to uh, let people know uh, that in with certainty that the Lee McCarthy, the Sam McGuire, and the National Football League Cup were all made by the same family. Wow, that's very interesting. And so is. the makers themselves are, are another whole story, I guess. Is Was there maybe two or three companies in Ireland that did them all, or did it change by province over time? Or uh, well, I suppose, how did people get them made, particularly at the start? Well, there would be a load, many, many silversmiths all over the country, but I suppose in this particular occasion, it's for the main, uh, uh, yeah, the, the cups. The big cups, uh, yeah. And, there are, uh, the, and, and on every trophy, uh, there is a hallmark or a, 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 a mark on it to indicate which company were made the cups. And there is a, a list of all those people. And if you had time and uh, a, a bit of uh, good eyesight to indicate which was the company that made the trophy. Interesting. We were talking actually in the office just before about our own favourite cups. So Sweet Aston was mentioned, actually. But uh, I, I think the Cross of Cashel Cup is very interesting. So I brought it out. And you had told me a kind of a funny story about that, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with us. Well, it was um, the All-Ireland Under-21 uh, Cups. I think it was 1966, oh, yeah. Jerry, was it? 60? Oh, yeah. 65. Uh, they, were, they, they started the, 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 that competition. And Dr. Morris, who was a patron of the GA at the time, and the uh, Bishop of uh, Emily, Tipperary, Cashel. Cashel and Emily, and he uh, wanted to give a trophy, but he didn't want the players drinking out of the normal <laughs> cups. So he decided, got this designed, and I'm going to move away for one second, if you don't mind. But what he didn't realize, was uh, it's very heavy the but... trophy was <laughs> <laughs> and it's very heavy 
So the players themselves figured, uh, that, one figured that one out. So that, is a joke. so that has been replaced recently by the um, uh, James Nolan or Nolan Cup for the All Ireland Under 21, and the first winners of that were Waterford in 2016. But as you know, it's quite a, a heavy, a heavy trophy. Yeah. So we'll, that's actually it's down in the archives at the moment. So they're working on it. It is going to to go out. It's an interesting one. I don't think there'll be anything like that one again either. Um, the Bob O'Keefe Cup is massive. Why is it so big? Well, I suppose <laughs> it again. I, I I'm not sure who the um, makers of that was, but it was so intricate in terms of the design, and it 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 it's you know huge. But sadly, on the top of that cup, Julianne, on the lid of it, mm. was a little replica of, or a little um, figurine of Bob O'Keefe himself. Oh. But it disappeared. Gone, yeah. And it's only a little knob of yeah. silver on top of it altogether. Oh, I didn't realise that. And, it, and Bob O'Keefe played in his stockinged feet. He didn't wear boots. And that little figurine, if you can find That's it, it showed that there's no boots on, on the little figurine as well. But it, and a lot of cups, because they're made of silver, primarily, they're about 92% silver and a little bit of copper and bronze, John, I think, put into it, isn't it? There's uh, other, there's other uh, alloys put into a cup. It's not all silver, it's but a copper, copper, the copper. copper. And it's 92.5% silver, but it's a soft metal. And it is prone to, uh, I suppose, being wear and tear. Wear and, tear. and that's why cups are uh, uh, um, changed and, um, uh, you know, uh, replaced from time to time. And that's why Sam was and Liam were eventually. Uh, yeah, so the changed. original Sam and Liam's are, are down in our main trophy display. And you can see, you know, the, the dents. And we've all seen the photos of the babies in cups. And, yeah. and uh, you know, you can see scratches, people scratching initials into it, which is obviously lovely now because it's a record of the history of the cup, but it can't go on, I suppose, indefinitely. No, and I remember speaking with Des Byrne, uh, who made the second uh, Sam, and he was he would get quite annoyed when he'd see people sitting in the cup and abusing <laughs> it, and some people would, you know, it would have been kicked down the streets and things like that. So it's it's a matter of you know I suppose um, um, respecting the cups and yeah. trophies as well, and not putting people in. A... And what's your own favourite cup, or do you have one? I do, I do believe it or not. By travelling around over the country looking at these cups. There is the um, Derry Senior Hurling Cup, which I saw in Derry, and it's a tiny cup, but the amount of detail that oh. went into the cups uh, were just fantastic. And it goes back to the silversmiths, the designers, the people who put hours of work into it. And a cup isn't just one part of it, there's a whole element of uh, different elements that make up the, the, um, the, the uh, making of a cup. There are engravers, and if you look at uh, the Sam outside there, there's a whole lot of filigree and an awful lot of design, yeah. Celtic designs on it. And there are certain people who did that. And then there are people, there are engravers, and then there's polishers, of which John was a polisher. And uh, so it's not just one person. And Des uh, Byrne um, said to me, uh, it takes a team to make the cup and it takes a team to win the cup yeah which is a nice phrase. and actually a lot to think about because you don't you just think of the cup you don't really necessarily oh. think of all of that so it's very interesting um we were talking about the names of the cups is there many cups named after women um not a lot except in the ladies football um uh, there are sue rand's bottom is one of the cups and there's the Tyrrell cup uh, a, 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 a waterford lady uh, it's like the grounds. Yeah. There are very few grounds. There's only one ground that I know of national importance, and it's the Markovich Park in Sligo. But there are very, very few. Uh, there's the Cattley Mills Cup. And we talk about connections and things like that very, very briefly. Uh, the Cattley Mills, who was one of the greatest camogie players of all time, uh, and there was, they were going to name a bridge over her uh, right. in, 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 over the Liffey. But I was playing golf one day and I was talking to a friend of mine and I told him about the book and he said, do you know, uh, Kathleen Mills is, was an aunt of mine. And he was able to tell me all about her. But more importantly, he was able to give me a photograph that was not readily available. And that's what's in the book. 
a family photograph wow. of Kathleen Mills. So there are a number of cups, and there's the, the ladies' football, uh, the Mary Mar the Martin Cup. Yes. And um, there, so there's a couple of, um, uh, there are all right, but not in hurling uh, and football, sadly. We've actually, Kay Mills' medal collection there is up just behind uh, on the top floor of the museum as well. So another okay. thing, great add for the museum. I think she has 15. <laughs> yeah, there's a huge, she those. was the, the most for a long time until the, the Cork girls um, overtook her. But yeah, they're, they're up there, they look amazing when you see them all together. Yeah, yeah. And a nice segue in, you mentioned grounds. I know that's your next project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, very briefly, uh, when I finished the book on the, on, on, on the Cups, I uh, came across, obviously, Tom Semple. I said, that's Semple Stadium. Fine, easy enough. And then I said, well, there's Nowlin or Nolan Park in Kenny, or in my own town of Dungarvan, there's a place called Fraher Field. Then I said, how many people would know who those people were? Then I said, not a lot. So then I decided to, when I decided to pick the names of the people like the Cups, Julianne, it, that was a simple enough project. However, I decided to my cost to some degree yeah. to delve into the pitch, the ground, the land. And while we have beautiful stadiums all over the country, nobody knows who bought the land the first day and when it was developed into a beautiful stadium as we have now. So I started working on those a long time ago. Wow. And I'm still at them, hopefully have it finished shortly. But it's really about the history of the, 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 the purchase of the land, the development of the land, and then the other part of it the is person. the person after whom it's named. And there are some great stories about that. There are huge projects, Humphrey. Yes, indeed. Um, my wife and I don't have any rows anymore. Because she's in one room and I'm in the other. So <laughs> I do. <laughs> we hardly see each other. But, you know, it is. It, 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 but there is a huge amount of... Um, um, pro, um, uh, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? It's um, sources of uh, history yeah. within, and I, I see Siobhan Doyle is here, who's doing another book on on on, on um, pieces of um, objects, objects yeah. of the GAA, yeah. which are marvelous. So it's just about we take things for granted. Yeah, true. You know, uh, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily know that we're sitting on the Belvedere Rugby Schools. 15, 20 yard line at the moment. Yeah. That when Crow Park was bought originally, the man, Frank Deneen, who had it, who bought it, over borrowed and had to sell it to the Jesuits in Belvedere College. And nobody, very few people would be aware of that. There's a generation coming through. And my, I suppose, aim to some degree is to write down all of these bits of information on people on grounds that we just walk by and not know who Yeah, and you lose, were. eventually you do lose the stories if you don't record you them. You do, and, and that's why it's so important. It's a huge, rich tapestry out there, but yeah. it's just to somebody to put it together. And how important are the images in, in, I know the grounds obviously are, but for the cups, was it hard to find imagery? Um, are some, like, were some photographed at all? Or? Oh, they were, and Ray McManus of Sports File was a great help to me on that, in terms of getting the, a lot of those cups. But, um, there were a number of cups that, uh, and trophies, one in particular uh, that was uh, not uh, photographed uh, because it was locked up in a museum in, in Tullerone in County Kilkenny, and it was the Lowry Mar Museum. Mm. And I was lucky enough to know the great horror in Kilkenny, Tommy Walsh, who was from Tullerone, and um, Tommy got me a connection. This is where I'm talking about the family silver. He was able to give me a connection to the curator of that uh, locked up museum and in there it was uh, it was amazing to see the cups and shields that were in there wow. and I was able to get original or uh, photographs of those that weren't readily available to anybody else so it pays to know the right people in the right wow, place. Wow yeah <laughs> and a lot of groundwork and traveling around uh, the country. Traveling, uh, was grand but but when you got there Julianne. It was worth it. They, uh, they were really really uh, great and at the moment, when I'm going around the country uh, with, with, with meeting people about the grounds, they would embrace you. They'd tell you all about what they wanted. But you also must remember, back, back in the day, in the 30s and 40s and maybe 50s, that very little was written down. A lot of people who became secretaries of clubs or in positions of power 
never wrote, didn't write things down too much because they didn't want anybody else to know because <laughs> I want to be secretary next year and if you didn't know and if somebody else I'm didn't know. I'm not sure that's in the past, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> good point, good point. But yeah, and, and, and so therefore there was no record of it. But upstairs here in Crow Park on the sixth floor, they have the uh, finance department who have a lot of files and I was very privileged to be able to look at those for the grounds wow. and all that. So you had to extract stuff from people who are probably family members for the cups and uh, to get their uh, uh, stories about the people after whom the, 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 the cups are named. But it, it, it is something that I'm delighted I was uh, privileged to write, but there was also help from people uh, who, uh, who put it together. Yeah. And it's a combination of professional designers and editors who make it easier to read uh, uh, yeah it's a, great, it's a great achievement and we'll definitely have it now in the museum because it's certainly totally relevant for us to have as well so we're <laughs> delighted it's back in print now it's brilliant yeah.